watching Over the Edge from Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Dr. Batigan, welcome back to the program. Yeah, thank you. Good to be back. Now, Planet Nine, you authored a paper that Planet Nine might be the core of a gas giant from early in the solar system that might have been ejected. Now, explain that. The core of a gas giant, but not a complete gas giant like Jupiter. What, what would this thing be like? Yeah, so... Um, I suppose in order to uh, explain this properly, we should we should first define why uh, gas giants have cores in the first place. And really, this dates back to the theory of how giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn form in the first place. And they form, we're pretty certain, through something called the core accretion process, wherein first a solid object of maybe a few tens of Earth masses, maybe 20 Earth masses, something like that, forms. And then this object, which is primarily made up of ice and rock, begins to collect an atmosphere around it, a hydrogen-helium gaseous atmosphere. And this gaseous atmosphere grows slowly, and once it grows large enough, meaning that comparable in mass to the core itself, this object enters in third phase of what's called runaway accretion, at which point uh, you very rapidly grow from sort of 40 Earth masses to something like 300, something like the mass of Jupiter. Now, one thing we know at this point is that um, this process is not very efficient, namely very few cores, very few of these ice and rock cores actually grow up to be legitimate uh, gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn. Right? Jupiter and Saturn is a galactically rare effect. Only 10 or 15 percent of sun-like stars have Jupiter analogs. So what you're left behind with are a bunch of these large-ish 5, 10 Earth mass cores, so to speak, that that never went through the, the full process of growing up to be uh, a legitimate giant planet. Uranus and Neptune, we think, are two such examples, right? These are failed gas giants, things that never entered runaway. And Planet Nine is probably just a smaller brother of this of this group of, of failed cores. So a failed core. So if, if, if Uranus and Neptune are failed cores themselves, Planet Nine could be a sort of ice giant like they are, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, and of course, again, for now, we don't know exactly what Planet Nine looks like physically, but indeed it is possible and even maybe likely that the physical structure of Planet Nine is not too different from that of Uranus and Neptune. So it could essentially be um, a third ice giant in the solar system, but there's also, it, it's also been suggested that Planet Nine might be a captured object, meaning that it isn't from this solar system and that it's a rogue planet or former rogue planet. Yeah, it's a it's a really cool idea uh, to, to speculate about. Unfortunately, the probability of that actually being true is quite low. And the reason, and of course, we don't we don't know, right? We, we can't quite rewind the clock four and a half billion years and check. The reason it's it's unlikely that Planet Nine is a captured object is simply that if you are captured by, say, the sun early in its lifetime, uh, suffering an encounter with a passing star while it's still embedded in the birth cluster of stars, and, and Planet Nine is parked onto some orbit, the same types of encounters can then readily steal Planet Nine back from the sun. And so it's, it's this game of, um, you know, whatever makes you also breaks you, um, because the same the same type of stars that can that can drop off Planet Nine can then uh, steal it or destabilize it. So cumulatively, the probability of Planet Nine surviving in the birth cluster from a captured state is something like one percent. Mm -hmm. So it's it's quite low. That said, I should say that planet formation theory has rarely made. Um, you know, predictions that have come true. So uh, <laughs> we should quite discount it uh, too much based upon our understanding of what happened four and a half billion years ago. The sun is expected to pass close to other stars in the far future. Mm -hmm. Could could one of those stars steal Planet Nine? Uh, no, not, not now, not anymore. 
Uh, so for the first 100 million years of the sun's lifetime, it was embedded in a cluster of uh, maybe 10,000 other stars along which uh, it was born. And the the issue with these clusters is that within the clusters, the velocities, the relative velocities of the stars are quite low. They're about only one kilometer per second or so. So the interactions between the stars last a long time and, and they're quite effective. Now that the sun is in out of the cluster, in the field, in the galactic field, so to speak, um, the interactions are much more subdued. And this is both because they don't last as long because the velocity dispersion is about 50 kilometers per second. And importantly, also the the distance between the stars is much greater. So Planet Nine has an excellent chance of surviving uh, for basically indefinitely in the galactic field. And by indefinitely, I mean many, many Hubble times, many, many times the age of the universe. One thing that has, has struck me about objects in the outer solar system. When we, when we looked at Pluto, it surprised mm -hmm. us in, in that it has all sorts of interesting things going on. It's got organic chemistry. It's got all these type of things. Do you expect Planet Nine to be like that? Do you expect it, if it's a rocky and icy object, do you expect it to be something that looks like the outer solar system? Or do you think it'll look more like a terrestrial planet or something on the on that level? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I actually, I think that whatever it will be uh, will surprise us even more. I don't expect it to look like the surface of Pluto. I mean, Pluto's surface is really remarkable. And uh, I think it was, a, it was a great demonstration of how geology can recreate itself at kind of different uh, different temperature scales, wherein, for example, right in on the Earth we have glaciers um, that flow because water ice flows at kind of slightly sub-zero temperatures. At temperatures of Pluto, water ice doesn't flow, but then uh, other types of ice, CO ice, uh, flows. So a lot of the same processes get recreated with different constituents. I don't think Planet Nine's surface is going to look like that of Pluto. And the reason I don't think so is because I think it's engulfed in this large uh, hydrogen helium envelope. So I don't I don't think we'll ever we'll even get to see down to the surface. I'll be surprised if we will be able to. So I think it'll be more like Neptune, where all you see is an atmosphere. Now, say you find it, mm -hmm. say you identify Planet Nine. Can we send a probe? Um, yes, it's it's a little bit far away <laughs> for 600 astronomical units. Remember, New Horizons is the fastest thing we've built and sent, and it took about a decade to get to Pluto, and Pluto's at 40. So, can we can we do better? Turns out the answer might be yes, and I, along with a number of other people, are actually involved in conceptual development of, of these um, very long-range missions. And the idea behind them is basically rather than trying to <clears throat> rather than trying to fly out, you first fall towards the sun and then during the close encounter with the sun you try to uh, shed a bunch of mass and fire all thrusters at once and then you can get up to something which is an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. So the technology is not quite there yet, but there, there are ideas out there and there's development. Um, so if, if that pans out, then Planet Nine actually is within reach. And by within reach, I mean you send a mission and it only takes 20 years to get to Planet Nine. <laughs> So in other words, you would do sort of like the Parker Solar Probe, where you send it very close to the sun and slingshot it out there? That's right. That's right. What what time frame? Uh, well, I mean, definitely uh, not in this decade and probably not in the next decade, but perhaps the decade after that. I see. So we could get out there and take a look at the planet. Now, some another paper also suggested that maybe there's a planet 10 and that there's some kind of orbital resonance weirdness going on. What do you think of that? Uh, so there, uh, indeed, this this paper uh, that I, I think you're referring to the the Malhotra et al. Uh, result, it's it's an interesting paper. It's, it's completely unrelated to anything planet 9. 
uh, meaning that the planet that they are considering is is an object which is actually much closer than planet 9 itself and much much uh, smaller in terms of both radius and mass so what they're what they're speculating about is a mars sized object which resides maybe a factor of a couple further away from the sun than pluto it's not implausible you would have to be careful about hiding it from existing observational surveys and the best way to do that is to imagine that such an object if it exists uh, resides against the backdrop of the galactic plane right so the the galaxy on the night sky is a place where nobody looks for solar system objects just because the density of stars is so high so you could in principle hide things against the backdrop of the galaxy you know it's a it's an interesting idea an interesting idea um but at the same time you you have to wonder i mean how many objects could be out there yeah that's right and and it as far as large objects like planet 9 you are limited indeed you're limited by dynamical stability right you can't just park the a bunch of them uh in the outer solar system and and expect that they will not scatter one another so that's constraint one you also can't park too much mass out there uh, without violating the spacecraft trajectory constraints as we talked about earlier and what's further interesting is if you go too far out uh, and by too far out i mean really 1000 2000 astronomical units then you start to have another problem which is that Early in the solar system's lifetime, such objects could be readily stripped away by passing stars. So there's there's really a limited amount of real estate that's available for for big planets in the outer solar system. You can still park, you can still have kind of Mars-sized things, uh, which are which are really not very massive. I mean, Mars is a factor of ten less massive than the Earth. Yeah, so it's not it's not too bad. But as far as big kind of super Earth neptune type things you really are limited and on that note there is no such thing as free real estate that was a bit of material that went over the edge a bonus clip from a full episode of event horizon new episodes every thursday so do be sure to hit subscribe the full episode should be on your screen right about now <laughs> <laughs>